case. When I wake up, I think about the case. When I see the police, I think about the case. Innocent, right? Today, Lynette White's boyfriend, 21-year-old Stephen Miller, appeared before a closed session of Cardiff magistrates. I'm not sure if you've gone through somebody who's been killed. It's not nice. Especially when you've been accused of it. Thirty years I've been living with this hate. Why did they pick on us? You feel I've been at seven days. You think you put your put into my mouth? I know. Tell you are. are. I am. And then you got the police officers. They, they want to friend us, man. They friend us. Where's the justice for us? We're still waiting for justice. I'm speaking to TV. Do you know how nerve-wracking it is? Because people don't know you in your business. I'm doing it for Ronnie. I'm doing it for Della. I'm doing it for Paris. And I'm doing it for John. That is the only reasons why I'm here. Because Adela and uh, Ronnie, they can't talk. Lynette, very tight in my heart. The amount of... I have to say enough. Just said enough. Enough's enough. <laughs> Couldn't even protect her. Couldn't even be. Couldn't even protect, protect her. There. Twenty-year-old Lynette White was found brutally murdered in a flat in James Street in Butte Town. Well, everyone was shocked at the murder because it was just on our doorsteps, really. A young girl being murdered, brutally murdered, in the area. The alarm was raised when a girlfriend of hers went to the local police station, saying Lynette had not been seen in her home in Grangetown since last Tuesday. It was a horrendous murder. Lynette White had been stabbed 50-something times. The details of it are utterly shocking. It is almost certainly a vicious, frenzied attack on this young female. And death has been caused with a sharp instrument People were appalled and frightened. So people worried about their kids going out and, you know, there was a big police presence. Police entered the James Street flat and found her body on the floor of the front bedroom. Well, she had been subjected to a sadistic attack. There was quite a lot of damage done to the upper half of her body. Police are still searching for the murder weapon. She died after a frenzied attack with a sharp instrument believed to have a six-inch blade. I remember it like it was yesterday. I said, to, I said to my missus, whoever they get for this is in big trouble. You're completely shocked. You know, it's half a mile from my front door. The man said to me, uh, did you hear about the murder? I, I said to him, uh, who is it? He said, Lynette White. So then I'm thinking to myself, who's Lynette White? Oh, sweet girl. She was sweet. I've known her since she was about 14. She was a very small, petite girl, very quiet. She liked clothes when she could get them. She liked to have a good time. She liked to dance. She liked music. Lynette's childhood was quite difficult because um, her mother had left. And for one period of time, she stayed with her father, who was a lolly driver, and just stayed in the lolly with him while he drove around. 
and she lived with her grandmother till her grandmother died. So she didn't have a steady, stable childhood at all. When I went to Cardiff and I was with Lynette, I had the strange looks of uh, people in Cardiff thinking, oh, Lynette's with this guy from London. But we did manage to get together and the first couple of weeks it was fantastic and she's kind of, she had a, like a quirky uh, attitude. She had a funny laugh. I really, I really, uh, I would say like a Minnie Mouse laugh kind of thing. When she used to laugh, I used to crease up. Beautiful personality. She was really sweet, but, you know, she'd had some troubles. We were all sad, because we all know her. It, it gets to you and you think, Jesus Christ. Bizarrely, whenever there was a, a big investigation that broke um, anywhere within, certainly within Cardiff, um, there was a, a sense of excitement because it might have been one that you were going to be involved with. John Williams would appear uh, whenever there was a major investigation. Last night, a friend of hers called at the docks police station because she was concerned having not seen her for a few days. He would conduct the briefings for officers such as myself who were uh, enlisted to, to assist in that particular investigation. Extra police officers have been drafted in to take the strength of the investigating team up to 62. I mean, there was a substantial number of officers working on the case. It was hard not to know uh, anybody who was working on that inquiry. What can you tell us about uh, the evidence and the suggestion she may have been prosecuted? I, I don't want to go into that aspect at this present time, but I will tell you that she is a local girl and she is fairly well known on the docks. Lynette White was 20 years old. She was well known in the docks area of Cardiff and worked as a prostitute. She was found brutally murdered in the flat where she used to take clients in James Street. There was a lot of fear because nobody knew who had done it and the fact that there was a murder. Although people think, you know, there's always lots of murders in Butte Town. No, there wasn't. Butte Town is physically detached from the rest of Cardiff. The major barrier is a bridge across the main South Wales to London railway line. It was a place that had been home to migrants and immigrants to Wales for very many years. So the population was very mixed. I grew up with Somalis, Arabs, Africans. We're all in this melting pot, in this little tiny space. We are not portrayed in a positive light. It is a mindset that is about Butte Town is a particular place with a particular group of people living there. And that idea that came from the old Tiger Bay, you know, prostitutes, drunks, pimps and fights prevails. And somehow that sort of narrative gets into whatever is happening in Butte Town. Docklands a close community, but police say they're disappointed that more prostitutes haven't come forward. Lynette White was a beautiful, vibrant, bright, really loving, caring, intelligent, switched on young, young girl. Lynette told me she was on the street because she was having problems in a home when something, something happened anyway. So she was either going to live in hell or run, and she decided to run. She's my partner. I loved her. I wanted to do the right thing by her. The difference between me and Lynette and other people who live their life with their partners, that they've probably got a nine-to-five job, 
Lynette, she had a, like a nine to whatever time she came home. Stephen Miller, we thought that, you know, that she was from the get-go. Do you know what I mean? Because like, he was like, kind, of, kind of like a slowly, all right, yeah, all right, right, yeah, see Lynette anywhere, nah, nah, I've been looking for her all day. He, to me, was like Lynette's teddy bear. There's many a times I've told her, do you want me to come and sit near where you are? So at least I know that you're safe. And she says no, because if you do that, they're going to look at you like you're doing, you're pimping off me. And also, the police will do, say that you're pimping off her. If you did not know Lynette and you was walking the streets or you saw her in a, in a, in a, in a cafe and you spoke to her, you wouldn't have believed that she was a girl who was walking the streets. You wouldn't believe because she was that so easygoing. I mean, she was so easygoing, she would help anybody. Do you know what I mean? That is what really chokes me uh, for so long, is that I could have done something more to, like, try and get her off the situation she was on. They brought me to uh, Butte Town Police Station, sat me in a room, uh, they closed the door. I'm sitting down there looking around, thinking to myself, what the F am I doing in here? They sat down, they looked at me, uh, told me we found a body, a girl's body, in 7 James Street, and we believe it's Lynette. So it was just like a split second. I'm, all I heard is body and Lynette. That's, I didn't hear anything else, murder or anything. I didn't hear body, Lynette. That's all I heard. And it was just, I was just like looking straight at them. And I just broke down. I just cried. It's logic that you're going to look at the person, the spouse, who's the person who's been murdered. They're going to, I put my hands up and I says, I understand that. But I told them exactly where I was. I says that I was um, in the Casablanca club, in the back of the uh, uh, playing pool. The first thing they thought for skin colour, London. Skin colour, London. You're up to no good. So you're with, you're with this girl, who's, who's a known person who's, who's uh, on the game. You're probably pimping off her. I was a hustler. I sell weed, took a bit of coke, but it didn't make me a murderer. I gave them blood, everything. I says, take anything you need. They took my blood, everything. They took my clothes. I said, take my all my clothes. This is what I was wearing. There was a lot of blood in the flat. There was blood all over the walls. A lot, most of the blood obviously um, belonged to uh, Lynette, but uh, clearly the, her killer had also cut himself. The blood that the killer had shed, you know, was, you know, was good, solid evidence. It's not as exact as DNA, but you can certainly rule out people with different blood types and so forth, and it was quite a rare blood type. When they let me go, they says, if you hear anything, Stephen, can you go out there and talk to people? I tell them, I says, listen, you tell me what to say, I'll go out on the street and I'll, I'll tell them, I'm out here for Lynette and to get justice for her. And I came across Leanne Day, and I cursed her off. I says, you and your friend, you better fucking say something to her. You better say something to the police. Because I know you know something. I know you must know something. Because you're the only one who I know who knows Lynette. And the only person I was thinking of was Leanne. She was the main one out of all of them. It was Leanne, Lynette, and Pesela. In the early days, the police followed the obvious lead, really, which was when a sex worker is murdered, generally it's a punter. What about the prostitutes who work in the Docklands area of Cardiff? Have you got any message for them? I would ask them to tell my officers all the information that they have. They know Lynette, they are her associates, they know where she goes, what she does all day, and they are the people who may well hold the key to this terrible murder. 
the entire community thought, wow, must be a punter. It was as simple as that for me because that, that was the only thing that we knew, right? A, she was, she, was a, she was a street girl, and B, we knew that that address was, was, was a place that, 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 that's used. The life of a sex worker in those days was extremely tough. They were frequently attacked by punters, by people hanging around in the pubs that they used to hang around in. To be perfectly honest, the police never have, uh, had much sympathy with them. Well, if the girls were out or not, they'd either go doubles or they'd be watching one another, taking car number plates. Most of those girls didn't have anything really to do with Lynette. Lynette was a loner. She's just kept herself to herself, done what she had to do, and go home. We got out of the car and we saw this strange looking man just here. And he was in a, obviously in a state, he was distressed, he was clutching himself and appeared to be trying to hide his hand inside his coat. And his hand had blood on it, it was evidently injured. That was the location, definitely with the railing behind. He seemed quite a small man to me, pale skin, very pale. He looked tired and he looked anxious. We had eye contact and I could see that his hand was, had a bandage on it or, or, or some sort of thing wrapped around his hand and there was blood on his hand and on his coat. Well, John Williams, you're quite anxious to talk to this gentleman whose photograph you released last week. It, it now looks as if he has sustained a cut to his right hand. And we know that this particular gentleman has walked along this street here come down past the museum and in fact either sat on this capstan or particularly near this capstan. He's distraught, he's upset, he is crying. He's got blood on him. And what about some of Lynette's clients in the last week of her life? Well, this is a very difficult area, but I would ask those people to come forward and speak to us, possibly before we may get to them and cause them some embarrassment. Police are now making house-to-house -house inquiries, trying to trace anyone who saw Lynette White after last Tuesday. It was clearly a very challenging uh, investigation, uh, a huge investigation, um, and one that was very, very difficult, um, not least because there was so little assistance uh, from the community. Conducting house to house inquiries, uh, can we come in and have a chat? And so they come to our houses doing these um, house to house inquiries. Now, this is Valentine's Day, <laughs> you're drunk. I, I don't know where I was, I don't know where I was. But, Day, the day before, the week before, I don't know, they asked me these questions. You weren't particularly welcome. You had sort of uh, illegal uh, drinking dens, you had some illegal gambling going on, because they liked sort of to keep their own uh, culture amongst themselves to a great degree. And we wanted to try and get them to engage perhaps a little bit more with us in terms of policing uh, than they wanted to. They saw us as a bit of a nuisance. Comes again. And then you answer the same, same questions, you answer the says what you're saying. Because to you it's not important. It doesn't do with you, you did nothing. Police fear they've hit a wall of silence as they hunt the person who killed Lynette in a frenzy of violence. There was no suggestions that, what, oh, he could have done it, he could have done it. No one knew nothing. So the wall of silence was the wall of, no one knew nothing. I'm sure if anybody would have knew anything, they would have phoned the police, anonymously probably, but they would have phoned police, I'm sure. So that wall of silence was just them starting their little 
you know, whatever they wanted to start, you know, just blame it on the community. Tiger Bay, Boot Town, and the traditional reputation, even in those days, of a sort of pretty rough place, Docklands, uh, and there you had to be tough to be a lawman. And you had certain policemen who would fit that mould. In the context of the time, that's what was needed. The culture in those days was it was a case of uh, work hard, uh, play hard. Um, it was very male oriented. Um, lots of ingrained attitudes, uh, which certainly wouldn't be wouldn't be tolerated uh, today. I, I guess in those days it was a reflection of society at the time. Um, there was misogynism. There was racism. Back in the eighties, you know. You're dealing with the police. It was scary, you know, what, what they do to you, you know? The upfront racism and brutality of the police had sort of calmed down a bit, but was still evident. So that you could still be picked up off the street, given a hiding by two or three policemen, and then charged with assaulting a police officer. That was still going on. You know, they stop you and call you names, black bastards, niggers, everything, whatever name they, they can call, they call you it. Went back to my mum's house. To, to be totally honest, I was a bit pissed off with the Cardiff people. I tried my best to get her off the, off the game. But people always perceived, oh, he's with her, so he must be getting something from her. And I've been telling people all the time, I, I never put Lena on the game. I was trying to get her off the game. That is the reason why we was arguing all the time. We all want to see crime was because we all want to know what's happened. The doctor just emptied, and all, all of us have gone home to watch Crime Watch, not knowing really much about what's going on, the injuries and certain things. I don't know much about nothing. That afternoon, a woman walking down James Street noticed a man who was standing in a doorway. He appeared to have blood on his hands. This is next door to where Lynette took clients. Now, the man seen virtually outside the flat that she used to take clients to must be the prime suspect, a man who was mumbling, incoherent. I gather he was crying at times, too, blood on his hands. That is right. He certainly is a person who we must speak to at this time. Would other people have, have seen him? And if so, how would they have noticed him? We've, we've compiled a, a, a Crime Watch video fit. What are the distinctive features? He is very distinctive. He's got dark brown, greasy hair with lightning towards the front of it. At that point, the entire community was, was, was convinced that the police had a, had a case against an individual that they were looking for. And all they were doing was anticipating uh, the moment that this person would be captured and brought to justice. They've got a good description, you know? It's just a matter of time, isn't it? This morning at St. Patrick's Church in Grangetown, family and friends gathered to pay their last respects. We were all sad. Could we all know her? I know her father, know her uncle. He's friends with my old man. I choose to remember her as a little girl with her grandfather, chat, chat, chatting and not being able to keep still and smiling and talking and the grandfather saying, she's been talking for an hour and I haven't got a clue what she's been on about, but she doesn't care if we listen or not. She just likes talking. And I like Lynette. She was a nice kid. She had a sad life. That's all she wanted, was someone to love her, love her properly, love her and care for her properly, that's all she wanted. Not asking for much, is it? Sad. When it's all said and done, 
I just want remember, people to remember Lynette for who she was. You know what I mean? And see her for who she was, okay? She was a beautiful person. She had ideas, ambitions, dreams, just like you and me. Leanne Vilde, Angela Pasila and Lynette were all very close friends, I understand, and they were in each other's houses frequently. The police questioned Leanne Vilde and Angela Pasila on numerous, numerous occasions, and each of their initial statements was denied knowing anything about the murder, who was involved in the murder. They were sure that Leanne was holding out on them, and at one point they even took her to see a hypnotist in Wigan, I think, uh, to see if she could remember more about what had happened on the night of the murder. There wasn't any one person particularly. No. Did she ever say their names? No. I went there with her. I could see she was under, um, but I knew there was nothing going to come out. Now, when you're waking up, you feel very relieved because you've said every single minute that passed to the police and everything you said has been true. That's what, that's what the doctor was saying as well. well why is she saying anything? Well, there's nothing there for her to say. She don't know nothing. It's fine. It's fine, but... She hasn't given you any more information because she hasn't got any more information. I'm like that. I fucking told you. You know? What a waste of taxpayers' money. <laughs> That's what I see. For six months, a team of detectives has been sifting through the masses of information they hope will lead them to Lynette's killer. 6,000 people have been interviewed and they've taken statements from 3,000. As the inquiry had stonewalled, uh, there was a change of personnel in the summer of 1988. Two new people came in, Tommy Page and Graham Mountcher. Uh, Graham Mountcher from Canton CID. In the 80s, it was like the Wild West, to be quite frank. The South Wales police were a law unto themselves. There were police stations in Cardiff that were synonymous with malpractice, um, false confessions, overhearing confessions, and it, it was that bad. Prior to tape-recorded interviews, all interviews were handwritten and signed. You've signed permission for me to see you. The method in those days, it was pretty rough and ready. If you sat as a group of detectives around a table and you were discussing perhaps a robbery, if one officer said, well, I think this could well be Joe Bloggs, and because I've dealt with Joe Bloggs in the past and this sounds a bit like him, we'd probably go and arrest them. Now, when you analyse how much evidence you've got to arrest Joe Bloggs, it's not a lot, except perhaps a sort of a, a gut feeling. But that was the way in which quite often it was done, and 90% of the time, you're probably right. So in those days, we'd probably be more inclined to go out and arrest a suspect based on little evidence and then try to build the case around the suspect. Everyone was getting suspicious of each other because the police seemed to be milling around everywhere. People were being pulled in left, right and centre. Here we are, white man, outside 7 James Street, and now half of Cardiff docks are being pulled in for a murder. Why? You know, we couldn't, we couldn't understand it. We were all nervous because who, who could do that on our, you know, in our community? There was so much speculation going on, I think that everyone was suspecting each other. It was absolutely ripping the community apart. 
I think when the police began their investigation, there was pressure on them to find the culprit. I think after 10 months, the pressure was on them to get a result, which is a totally different thing. There was definitely work ongoing at the time to try and uh, improve uh, not only the, the physical appearance of Butetown, but also what people thought of the place as well, trying to uh, just improve its image. And obviously a crime such as this certainly didn't help. Um, and that just only added to the pressure of ensuring that um, an arrest was made. I would have imagined a Cardiff Bay sitting out there going, well, this whole dream package that we've spent all of this time trying to put together is about to fall apart. I don't think anybody told them to do it illegally or unlawfully. I just think pressure was put on them to get it solved. By December of 88, the pressure on the police was almost intolerable. The 7th of December, 1988, was the last time my foot was on the street. From Camberwell Magistrate Court, straight to Cardiff. And, and I mean, it was a convoy. A convoy. My brother in one car, me in another car. Today, Lynette White's boyfriend, 21-year-old Stephen Miller, and his 26-year-old brother, Anthony, appeared here before a closed session of Cardiff magistrates. I know I didn't do nothing wrong. And I know my brother, he wasn't even around at the time when Lynette got me, because he was in London. He got married in London. This interview is being tape recorded. I am DC Peter Greenwood. The date is the 7th of December of 1988. I am interviewing Stephen Wayne Miller. Also present is Detective Constable John Seaford. What's happened, uh, Stephen, is that <coughs> I don't believe that certain people are responsible for the murder of Lynette. Yeah. One of those people we think is involved in the murder of Lynette is yourself. Myself. It was Greenwood who says she got stabbed to death. She had a wrist cut and her throat was nearly severed. I mean, nearly cut off. I've got nothing to do with it. If I told you, yeah. I would tell you, right? It's got nothing to do with me, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know. I, I had no sisters for a couple of interviews. I was there by myself. That got me even more uptight, angry, very, very angry, making the police look at me in that way that I've taken part in the murder of my partner, who I've tried to get off the street and who I loved. Police have now been interviewing Lynette's boyfriend, 21-year-old Stephen Miller, here at Butte Town Police Station. Several other men are also said to be helping police or are being sought as part of the inquiries into Lynette's death. Inquiries which are now set to continue well into the weekend. I was in bed at the time. My daughter had been born. Um, she was in the cot. She was 10 months old. There was a knock on the door. And I looked out of the window, and then I could see four or five CID there. And I thought, what the fuck do they want? So they jump on me, push me up against the wall. Is you Anthony Paris? Yeah. But he's arrested you on suspicion of murder. So I said, well, who's dead? Oh, Lynette White. But I said, you haven't having a laugh. You're serious. I mean, you fucking serious? Are you fucking serious? Oh, yeah, John, um, if you don't come in, we'll have to call back up. I said, well, go and sit in your car, and I'll come down. One man who had had a long history with the Cardiff police was John Acty. 
and I think they were very keen to uh, make a case against John Acty. If he turned out to be the murderer, they were frankly going to be delighted about it. Does he have a long criminal background? Uh, he is well known to the police then, let's, let's, let's put it as mildly as that. Oh my gosh, the police hated him. He was like a bad boy, you know, he'd have no fear whatsoever. He'd look him in the eye and tell him, go and get your superior, because you're not big enough to take me. <laughs> He was certainly one of the, uh, the characters that was very, very well known uh, within the Butte Town community. I first knew John Acty when I was 10 or 11 years old. We, we played for um, Cardiff schools under 11s, uh, rugby union together. Uh, he was a very big boy for his age uh, and he, he just commanded respect on and off the field. Talk about John Lomo, he was John Lomo, David Bishop and Mark Ring and all that in his team, and he was their captain, you know, so he was a character, John, no doubt about it. I actually used to travel to games with John and his dad, who was, uh, was a lovely, lovely man. When my dad passed away, things, you know, took a, a turn for the worse, you know, in my life. The result of that was uh, John perhaps going off the rails When John first started fighting with the police, he didn't actually start fighting with the police for himself. He started fighting with the police to defend somebody else and quickly got that reputation. So police targeted John. John did goad them, but they provoked him. They continually provoked him, so every time he saw them, there was almost an expectancy that there was going to be a clash. I don't think anybody in the Dockland will shed any tears uh, if and when he is put away. Tony Paris, wow, what can I say about Tony Paris? Ladies man, yeah, player, disco dancer, hat, smart, do you know what I mean? Um, criminal, shoplifter, that's it. Tony Paris knew the red light girls because he was a bit of a fagan, so if he had stuff to sell, they would normally be the type of people that he can go to. But Tony, out of them all, was the one who seemed to be most unlikely to have committed the crime or been involved in any way at all. I wouldn't walk down fucking James Street with those other boys are talking about because I've told them no more the times I don't know nothing, I haven't done nothing, and I do not hang around with these boys. They might go and kill somebody with them. Ronnie Acti follows closely on the tales of John uh, and is almost... Uh, a caricature of him, but I don't think that he has the same uh, physical or mental strength as John Acty. Why they want me off the street? I'd love to know why, you know. He had been in trouble with the police before, but just petty, really. I don't know why they chose Ronnie or the other men. They seem to just choose five black, randomly chose five black men. Yusuf Abdullahi was um, um, he was like um, um, a character, you know. He was like he was like um, 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 a boy about town, you know. I mean, he was into what he was into. He had a really good relationship with a lot of the girls, uh, the working girls in particular. He was a bubbly, lovable crim, lovable crim, you know. And those all the characters, you know? I mean, none of them flipping angels. Do you understand what I'm saying? But none of them are murderers. You're a vicious, evil, wicked man. Well, I don't think I am. I'm well, an innocent I think man you being are. persecuted. I think you are. I'm an innocent man being You're persecuted. You're a disgrace to the human race. The firm I was working for in uh, 1988 represented Yusuf Abdullahi. Yusuf was, at the time, I suppose the same age as me, so we I suppose had a natural bond, but he was a violent drug dealer. I suppose the one thing he wasn't was a murderer. Also present is Inspector Richard Powell and Stuart Hutton, the Stratton Solicitor. John was frustrated during the interview process. 
it was as if his replies were not what they wanted. So we had to go through the motions of putting up with it for the time. Now, you could be protecting somebody, or John, you may be involved yourself. Now, listen, what are we to think if you do listen, not tell us? Listen, I am telling you, I have got nothing to do with no murder. I do not know nothing about no murder. If I knew, I would love to help you, but I can't. I could have said no comment, but, you know, when you're in them situations, you want to explain everything just to make, you know, it clear you wasn't there. Go a little way, John, towards helping us. Listen, just point. I would love to. I can't. I Because I don't know nothing. John, I think you said it right there. You can't. I can't because I don't know nothing. No, yes. Can't. Oh, don't be silly, don't Mr. Paul, whatever your name silly is. You're tough. I'm You're talking ridiculous. We've had six, no seven no interviews now. No we haven't gone no further. No, they was kind of like um, wary of me. They didn't treat me like they treated Tony and, and, and Stephen and Dulla. Do you know what I mean? They didn't shout at me and scream at me like they were screaming at them guys, you know? And this thing is getting scary. Banging tables, banging tables. You did this. You were stabbing the net. It's all sick. It's all, it's all fucking crazy. Don't know that what girl done. is mutilated. I do that not. girl is mutilated. No. You can't. You, you, you have not have a, You how can you sit there and tell us you know nothing at all? Easy, because I wasn't there. It's easy for me to say. You don't want to believe it. It's there, easy for me to say. You don't want to believe it. I wasn't there. They're trying to twist my brain and mess up my head. And I'm telling them I don't know nothing. I don't get into trouble that bad with police. So they would have thought they can bend me easily because I don't go to jail. I was involved in the case right from the beginning. I can remember thinking when Tony had been arrested for murder, that just wasn't him. He was a shoplifter. <laughs> he wasn't a murderer. I was particularly involved with my uh, one of my clients, Ronald Zakti. Ronnie ended up asking the police questions. He the, the, he was being questioned, and he, he, in all fairness, had an answer for everything. If I was there, then where was my car? Or if I didn't have that car at that time, how could you say my car was there? And it, it was bouncing on off the police. To the extent that I was not terribly worried about Ronnie's interview because he was giving as good as he was getting. We knew what is allegedly being said by people because our witnesses were saying it had to be put to Tony in his interviews. Why don't you come up to it now and tell us the truth? Because the blooming put this girl in at peace because she's not at peace. She's down there, she's got a mutilated body, she's got her head hanging off, and that girl is not in peace. So let's have the truth off you, and now. Another police officer comes in and says to me, we've got statements saying that we were seen killing that white. You, John Ronnie Della Miller. These are witness statements. Right. These are evidence. Yeah. These are made by people yeah. who are going to stand up in court yeah. and say what they've seen. Right. But there's one person, and you know the girl, because she lived in St. Clair's Court. You spoke with her, and that's Leanne Building. Yeah. They come in and they ask me if I knew Leanne Vilde, um, Angela Pasila, and so forth. And so I said, I'd never heard of these people before. I said, I might have seen them in the area. I said, but I don't know these people. Who are they? It was a shock. I mean, it was a shock. At the interview stage, I suppose my shock was that the police had actually had witnesses. And then 
you know, once then we saw the evidence, it was even bigger shock. This is a, 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 a synopsis of what Leon Velde said as follows. I ran into the living room, followed by Angela, and when I got there, I saw Lynette lying on the floor by the bed. I don't know if Lynette was still alive. In the room was Ronnie Acti, Dulla. John put the knife to my throat, and he told me to cut the wrists uh, because I had seen too much. Ronnie Acti said, if you don't cut, uh, we'll do something to your baby. I was speaking to John and, and Ronnie Acti, and there was other, other guys down the, in the cells. They were, they were quite dazed. I think everyone was very, very shocked. It just seemed absolutely unrealistic and unbelievable and shocking. If, if I'm actually doing what she's saying I'm doing, where's this forensics then? My hand printed on no wallpaper, no window, no nowhere. My blood is nowhere. So then it's, it's a lie. Angela Pasila, as follows. I became aware that someone had a knife and I saw Pineapple, Stephen Miller, stab Lynette, who was trying to get up off the bed, but was still being held by Tony Paris. It just didn't make any logical sense. Tony just looked at me in disbelief. He had his head in his hands and he was, I'm a shoplifter, Madeline, not a murderer. What on earth are they doing? Angela Basila and Leanne Vilde, well, their accounts don't marry or match, and they are confused, and um, they are damning. It sounds like a fairly strong case, not on paper. This is a ritual killing in which Vilde and Basila were made to participate. We know we got you in here because you murdered Lynette White along with others. Why should all these people lie about you? Well, why should they all tell lies full stop? Yusuf's alibi all the time was that he was on this boat, the Coral Sea, pulling up uh, metal from the hold all night and hadn't been in Cardiff. You were in the room at 7 James Street when Lynette might be stabbed, were you not? Not at all, I was on a Coral Sea working. You went up to the room with Tony Paris, Miller, Ronnie Acti, and John Acti. Not at all, I was working. You all got together, and you all took it in turns to stab her, did you? I was on a Coral Sea working. And to make matters worse, the two girls who were in the room with you, they were told to carry out certain acts, weren't they? I was on a Coral Sea working. And you actually stabbed Lynette White as well, didn't you? I was on a Coral Sea working. You're in the clutches of South Wales police. You know what they're doing, but you just got to sit there and, and persevere and tell them you wasn't there. You passed James Street on the Sunday night to see if the body had been discovered yet. Don't be silly. Don't be silly. Just fit in. No, don't be silly, Doug. You're, you're talking ridiculous. You're talking crazy. No, you, you're going a bit too far now, you know what I mean? You, you know. No, I knew. I knew they was fitting me up. I knew it straight away. I, I just knew it. As far as I'm concerned, right, it was a white guy on the fucking telly. And now you picked up five black guys. You don't think you're just picking up black guys? You can't be serious. No, no. No, not no, this. No, 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 no. You cannot be serious if you're picking up black guys for this. They knew the weak people, and they knew who was a bit stronger and how far they could push people. So, you know, they knew what they was doing, you know. Am I going to get an answer from you, Stephen? I told Come you already. On. I keep telling you over the old Would you again, have right? been I have there, been if there you were stoned? I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. So you could have been there. I wasn't there. When I first saw Stephen Miller in the cells, he d I, I didn't think he knew where he really was. 
he seemed very confused. Everything's just mixed in your heads. Do you know what I mean? You just—it's like a—it's like a you're making a cake. You got you put you put the flour in, you put the eggs in. Do you know what I mean? You put the butter in. Do you know what I mean? You put your, your raisins in there and you're stirring it up. It's exactly the same. You, there's so much things going in your head. I wasn't there. You could have been at Seven James Street. I wasn't there. If you, you were still they smashed my head up so much. I was. And they're telling you this and telling you that for hours at a time. I mean, hours and hours. Oh, you could sit there and say that, being in that room, seeing that girl there in the state she was in. And hours of course, putting things into your head. And you're supposed to have had all this wonderful care for her, seeing a damn head hang off and her arms cut and stabbed to death. I was not there. I kept saying I was not there. And they just in your face, in your face. Oh, you can ever... I wasn't there. Oh, you, I just don't know how you can sit there. I really I don't. I wasn't there. I just don't know how you can sit there and say it. I wasn't there. You were there that I night. There. Together with all the others, you were there I that night. There. He said, I'm just going to keep putting things into you. I'll keep putting things into you. That's what the, the officer said. You're not leaving it at that, because I'm never going to leave it at that. You know that. Because I am still going to keep going, and I'm going to put things into you every time. All you've got to do to, to, to make someone believe a lie is say it again, say, say it big, say it loud and say it often. And then the end of believing it, the end of thinking it's their own thought in the end, because it's been implanted so deep, so many layers type thing, you know? 
They could lock me up for 50 billion years. I said I was not there. Because you don't want to be there. No, I was not You don't want to be there. I was not there. And you can hear just how defenseless he was. You, you could hear he, 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 had, he had no intellect to defend himself. Now listen to what I'm saying. We already know you're doing half a gram. You're half smoking ash. You said that gives you a good buzz all night. Yeah. You were on the old booze. It's no wonder you got a hazy recollection of that night. I wouldn't have known what planet I was on. Did you see it? You're nodding your head, is that right? Yeah. That's right, isn't it? And something's gone wrong. Do you think that's the way it could have happened? I don't know. It could do. It could have happened like that. Yeah? Yeah, most probably. But I don't I wouldn't really know. As far as I know, because I, you can't I, I'm, remember? Just, I'm not certain that I wasn't there. That's yeah. all I am. I'm certain I wasn't there. But it could, it could happen. It could have happened. It could have happened. It could have happened, yeah. I was a sorry soul, I think. I think, I, I, I think if they said God was there, I would say, yeah, he was there with me. And I mean, I just cried. I mean, I just cried like a baby. Do you know what I mean? It's just terrible. Time's now 17.46. Stephen, will you confirm that nothing has changed between the last tape and this tape? Nothing. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed, nothing's at, changed all. at all. You're telling me what you know to be the truth. Yeah. Or the death of Lynette White. Right, yeah. We were in the room. John Acty's just walked past. He's yeah. seen this knife, you think? Yeah. Do you think that's what scared him? That's why he's going? Yeah. You sure? Yeah, positive. And then... In it goes. Then it goes, that's it. Into the side. Just into the side of where she dropped. What did she do? do you, could you see the pain on her face? Yeah, she, she was in agony. In agony? You could see it, yeah. Your girlfriend is now in agony? Yeah. That's when I started butting in. You and butted then, in? He raised the knife after me. Yeah. As if I wanted some. Now, you said in the other tape that you saw him stab her about 15 times, is yeah. that right? Yeah. Well, how did that come about? She's now been stabbed on the floor, he's threatened you with a knife. Yeah. What happened he then? He said, take that. Take this. And he says, so kept choking. He kept choking. He kept choking. You're saying he, he kept on stabbing yeah. Lynette as she lay on the ground? Yeah. And you were watching this? I was out. I went out. You saw him be, her being stabbed? Yeah. And he kept on doing it, and yeah. kept on doing it, and you couldn't take out. anyone and went? Yeah. Were you still doing it when you went? Yeah. He was. He hadn't stopped. He didn't stop. Would you describe it as a frenzied attack? What do you mean, a frenzy? Was he now beyond himself? Was he now l acting like a madman? I would say so, yeah. Just freaking out, man. You were stunned, but you knew exactly what was yeah. happening. Agreed? Yeah I, couldn't be, yeah, I couldn't believe it. My head was just, my head was just going round and round and round. Just to make that clear, you knew exactly what was yeah. going on. Yeah, I do. You saw Tony, Tony Paris stab Lynette. At least 15, 15 times, times. And you didn't stop him. I tried to stop him, but he'd come to me with a knife. Threatened you with a knife. me with the knife. You've got to get this bit right. You've got to get it right. You're going to have to go through this all over again and again and again until we get it right. You're there, but there's still bits missing. There's got to be, Steve. I don't know. I, I don't know. I was, I was stoned. I was standing next to the wall, you know what I mean? But you knew exactly what was going on. Yeah, I do. You were adamant to what you saw is the truth. Yeah, it's the truth. It's the fucking truth, as I'm sitting here right this fucking minute, man. Are you convinced yourself now that we've worked this out? Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Are you you're convinced yourself? Yeah, I know it. It's true. There's nothing you can't do. It's fucking true, man. This the fucking Jewish state I've ever said, man. This is true. This is my fucking life, man. Yeah, you're right. Fuck you now, boy. <laughs> All right. Why did I break and accuse innocent men? of something they didn't do. Now that's something I have to take to my grave. And they took us down and, and um, Cardiff Central Police Station and they cuffed me, then they put me in a cell five defendants, they were taken out of their cells and then they were all handcuffed more or less together, two officers. There must have been about 25, 30 officers maybe. I never wanted to be so black as on this occasion where they're looking for the white boy. 
This is a bunch of South Wales police, bunch of CID from Cardiff, you know? You know, they're all friends. They was all standing there, all grinning. And then to hear the words, you are being charged with the unlawful murder of Lynette White on the 14th of February, 1988. And I just did that. Baffled. It's just fucking, what, what? And then suddenly, here we are, and we're in it. That is it. And there was no going back. I thought to myself, we're going to come to court, and then we could, we could say our piece, and then we're going to prove our innocence. This is a five-hander murder trial. We never witnessed anything like this before. You've got all these police in their cars. My people's IRA. The focus was on confession, not necessarily getting the truth. You're going down, you're getting life. It's like, bam, in your face. Why are she saying this about me? The jury foreman was then asked for the verdict. He said... Now I'm in the East Coast, sorry when I